maybe Garrett, I'll ask you a question when, while Dr. Crawford comes in. Um, do you give any sort of specific uh, instructions to your patients, either in terms of preparing them for the optilum, in terms of what to expect um, yeah. at the time of the procedure, maybe in the, the days and weeks following? Yeah, so I think um, just like any uh, BPH intervention, it's all about setting patient expectations. And, you know, I think letting them know what to expect can avoid unnecessary, you know, calls and, you know, and relieve a lot of patient anxiety too. And so and when counseling these patients um, for the upcoming uh, Optilum procedure, typically we'll counsel them uh, that typically they can expect a, a catheter uh, on average about two days is, is what we've been uh, doing. And then once they get the catheter out, they can expect to have some irritate avoiding symptoms, you know, some urgency, some frequency, some blood in the urine, um, which may persist for, you know, on and off intermittently for a week or two. And then, you know, obviously there's the catheter irritation that they uh, can expect to have as well. But, um, but I think it's all about setting patient expectations and kind of, you know, making sure that there's no surprises up front. Great. Nice presentation, Garrett. Good to see you. Um, I have I have two questions for you. I mean, you you've been around to do a number of the different BPH mist therapies and medications and all the new things that are out there, and even uh, transurethral resections. We still do a lot of them. How would how would you rank this with the? I, I don't know what the terminology is. Kind of the patient satisfaction level that you've seen. Take a hundred patients um, that you've taken care of with BPH, how does it compare to Resume? How does it compare to Eurolift? How does it compare to a TUIP, TURP, things like that? I mean, what's your gut feeling? I don't want to put you on the on the spot here. And well, I understand these aren't randomized trials between it, but we can make some judgments on what's good and what's bad based on our, our interaction, what we know with patients. You know, that, that's a great question. And, you know, from, from my experience so far, I think patients ac appreciate the, that this is a minimally invasive treatment option that, that has, uh, that minimizes side effects, including, you know, no sexual side effects. But, you know, I think what we're seeing is that significant flow improvement as well is, is the symptom improvement. And so my gut feeling is, you know, so far we're, we're seeing this as a minimally invasive option that has TERP-like resective type numbers in terms of Im improvement, in terms of flow. And so I think you're getting benefits of, of a, a minimally invasive surgical therapy, but also with some of those improvements that we see with more of the resective technologies. Dean, what did, what's your feeling? Well, I think Garrett did a really good job talking about checking the boxes. And one of the things, of course, durability is important. Return to work is nice. Some of the key attributes as well of Opulum is the catheter time is relatively short. I mean, I think patients are really fine with a day or two of a catheter. There's no permanent implant. A lot of patients think, oh, I have to live with a balloon. You say, no, no, we just inflate it and then we're going to remove it at the end of the case. So they don't have a permanent implant or a foreign body. Um, and the recovery is quite quick. I mean, we see patients improving <clears throat> like almost right away and certainly within two weeks. And the other notable thing, at least in my experience, is the improvements actually get better. So one month is better than two weeks. Three months is better than one month. And in fact, six months, they actually are doing even better. So we see that improvement over time. But I think it's that limited catheter time, uh, sexual function preservation, uh, and no permanent implant. Those are sort of key attributes that, that give it you know, uh, a positive review by a lot of patients, for sure. It'll be uh, good to have some long-term data. I know that uh, Steve Kaplan showed some in the, in the trial. Let me ask uh, one final question, uh, Garrett, uh, to you. And that has to do with uh, the economics of this and reimbursement. And in academic centers where I am, sometimes we don't worry about all those things so much. But um, what what is it, the reimbursement been... Uh, your, uh, what what we uh, we had talked about what Medicare is paying and things like that. Have you had any problems or how is that working right now? Well, um, you know, I think from the uh, reimbursement standpoint, we're currently you know doing these in the surgery center, and um, you know the surgery center has has been 
very pleased with the reimbursement they're seeing is from a physician standpoint, we're still waiting on some of those codes to kind of having to crosswalk it right now, which is which which has been working out well from a reimbursement standpoint. Um, but I, I also see that this will be a procedure that when those codes come through, we can, you know, would like to bring this into the, the office setting. You know, I think that we can expect to see just as good, if not better reimbursement than, you know, what, you know, when we're, what we were seeing with the Eurolift procedure. And so, you know, we're, we're always looking at increasing overhead costs, you know, with running a practice in a private practice. So to have a procedure that checks the boxes, like we talk about in terms of, you know, patient satisfaction, r- patient relief, minimal side effects, but I suspect that we're going to see, you know, very good reimbursement with this, you know, performing this procedure in the office setting as well. No time, no time. Not, not last question. I said the last one was the last question. I was just thinking, Dean, what's the smallest prostate you've treated and the largest? Volume? So, so the indication, the clinical trials were done between 30 to 80. The on-label indications for prostates 30 and above, but the key aspect is is the prostatic urethral length. The prostatic urethral length really does matter. And the smallest prostate length is probably around 32 millimeters, give or take. So, because the smallest balloon needs to be able to fit. Um, The biggest prostate I've done is about 128 milliliters, um, 128 cc's, which was fine. I just used the largest balloon because again, volume isn't necessarily the whole story. It's the length. And the length was appropriate for the largest size balloon, which is about 47 millimeters, if I'm not mistaken. So time will tell how we're able to increase the size and length of prostates that we're able to do. But it really is not just a volume, but a, a length dependent procedure. Okay. Garrett? Yeah, I, I would say in terms of, you know, we're about 10 cases in right now and with our initial experience and, um, you know, probably the smallest prostate that we've treated so far was kind of in that 35 to 40 gram range in terms of volume. And, you know, on the, on the larger side, uh, it was right in there about 65 to 70 grams. So kind of in that, that, that range that we were looking at with the studies. But I, I would agree with uh, Dr. Elterman that uh, I, I think when it comes to sizing, I mean, when it comes, you know, looking at urethral length, we've got longer balloons to, to utilize. And I would agree that I, we could certainly push the limit in terms of, you know, assuming that there's not any significant intra, uh, you know, vesicle protrusion, you know, and, and no large median lobe there, um, that we can really, you know, I, I think push the size limit uh, on some of the, as we move forward. So the other, I mean, the other thing we are all concerned about, not many of these people do have elevated PSAs, the most common cause for all the other PSAs, and when you get older, the size of your prostate, not prostate cancer. Any, you just use the usual uh, workup when somebody comes in with a PSA of 4.0001 or whatever your cutoff is, um, and do molecular markers, uh, MRIs. What do you just use your standard uh, workup before you you, you uh, down the path to doing optimum BPH? Yeah. Most definitely. I mean, I think you would treat this, you know, just like, you know, a patient that was referred to you for an elevated PSA and didn't have any, you know, BPH symptoms. I think you, you, you work up the elevated PSA or you know, at least discuss those options with the patient and, you know, start with that first. And then um, assuming there's no concern with the, uh, with the markers, um, you know, possibly MRI, then, you know, certainly um, can go down the, the BPH path and, you know, looking at interventions like optimum and BPH. Okay, great. Listen, it has uh, been great to have both of you join the third part of our trilogy here on the optimum BPH and uh, cover uh, where the rubber meets the road, uh, the, the procedure and your experience uh, in selecting patients and outcomes. So thank you both for your time.